All right. Hi, everyone. And thank you for tuning in to No Proof Strong Start, our non out programming brought to you by Portland Cocktail Week. Uh, just a little bit about the No Proof Strong Start series, as this is our first one. Um, no Proof Strong Start will take every day in January at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here on the Portland Cocktail Week channel, where you can join us live or at your leisure, either on Facebook or on YouTube. Each week, we'll be bringing you uh, leaders in the non alc spirits world to help bridge that gap between bar and guest when it comes to zero-proof cocktail service. Um, my name is Shannon Michelle. Um, I'll just introduce myself here really quickly. Um, as your host of No Proof Strong Start, um, I myself have been a bartender for 11 years, and for the past five years, I have been sober within the industry. Um, which kind of gives me a little bit of a unique perspective on all of this. Um, I am also a partner over at Mover and Shaker Co. So you might have noticed me with some of our work there. Um, I also just recently started Brass Ring Cocktails, which is a bar events and consulting. I do a lot of non-alcoholic consulting now just because I feel like that is where my heart is leading me and where everybody thinks that the bartending community is kind of going, where we're going creatively with cocktails. Um, so that's what I like to pour myself into. Also, most recently, I went on tour with Focus on Health, um, where we did a no and low cocktail tour, which included a pop-up in about six cities. And we did educational pop-ups as well to kind of help people within trade to get a better understanding of how they can serve no and low proof cocktails. Today joining me is Seth O'Malley, who's the founding distiller over at Wilderton. And we are going to kick off Lush Life's No Proof Strong Start series with a deep dive into how understanding non-alcoholic spirits can make you a better bartender. We know that people aren't drinking less they're just drinking less alcohol these days. More guests are expecting better non out cocktails than ever, ever before, and that's where we come in. In this class, we will be doing a little bit of a deep dive into the production, the sensory characteristics of Wilderton non-alcoholic spirits, and then we'll explore how to put this knowledge into practice and how to develop non alk and low alk cocktails that are worthy of your bar and that delight the growing number of guests asking for them. So bookmark this video, grab a notebook, because there are 25 Wilderton gift packs up for grabs for the folks who score the highest on the quiz. You've got until Wednesday, January 17th to submit your answers at lushlifeproductions.com backslash Wilderton for a chance to win a box full of no proof surprises from our pals at Wilderton. So I'm going to bring Seth in here with us. Seth, how are you? Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so it's really great to be here. Um, as Shannon was saying, this is skills. Wait, let's see. How do I present? Sorry, bear with me here. We've got a little presentation for you guys today that Seth has kind of rounded up. He's going to be talking about the skills to pay the bills, right? Uh, yes. I don't know if we can see the presentation, though. Amara, would you mind uh, starting the presentation if you're able to? Awesome. Well, let's chat a little bit about you, Seth. Um, why don't you go ahead and tell everybody a little bit about you and your role with Wilderton and just, you know, just some quick little tips about Seth. Absolutely. Okay. So anyway, my name is Seth O'Malley. I'm the founding distiller for Wilderton. Um, you are seeing me right now at Wilderton, which is our distillery and tasting room. It's the first uh, of its kind in the nation, at least that we're aware of. We'll keep uh, claiming that until someone calls BS on it. Uh, so far, no one has. Uh, okay, hey, there we are. Great. And so right now I'm in my lab. This is where I do research and development. You'll notice behind me I've got all these apothecary jars with various herbs and spices. Um, that is what I am all about. So 
I am a distiller um, and I specialize in botanicals. So herbs and spices are, you know, really my wheelhouse. I am not a whiskey distiller. I don't make brandy, um, but I do make gin and aquavit and amari and uh, things that are sort of like chartreuse and things that are like Jägermeister. Uh, all of that stuff has just always you know, really captivated me. Actually, from a fairly young age, I was very into herbs and spices. Um, and at uh, the age of about 15, I started going to this tea shop in my town. And I really started falling in love with with tea and all of the different ways that this one plant uh, could uh, taste based on the way that people processed it, harvested it, oxidized it, whatever. And then the way that you could take that and create all these different sensory experiences by the way that you would prepare the cup of tea. Um, so obviously I was kind of a weird teenager, uh, but through some luck and happenstance ended up getting to take that interest and sort of make a career out of it. So um, before I uh, worked at Wilderton, I worked at that tea shop. I led tea tastings. Um, that was sort of my first love as far as botanicals go. And then I ended up having this incredible opportunity to run Townsend's Distillery, which is a uh, botanical spirits distillery. There I made Burnets and, and gin and all sorts of weird stuff uh, that was botanical in nature. Um, kind of a long story. Unfortunately, that place closed. Uh, but around the time it closed, I came into contact with Brad Whiting, who's the co-founder of Wilderton, who is a, 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 a local... Um, uh, he was managing Clear Creek Distillery at the time and was a... Uh, was very involved in the local sort of uh, spirits scene and, and, and very interested in craft spirits. And he had this idea to make non-alcoholic spirits and it was kind of just a bud of an idea and he didn't bring the production expertise so much but had sort of the conceptual idea and this business idea and most distillers weren't very interested in talking to him about that because their identities were so wrapped up in alcohol uh, but for me you know i i love alcohol i love the the, the various spirits traditions um but it's always been for me, you know, alcohol and distillation has just been a way of connecting us with botanicals. Um, it's been a kind of a, a medium of expression for herbs and spices. But this is really like what I'm all about. And I, I saw that as a really fun kind of intellectual challenge. Like, how do you make a spirit that feels like a spirit isn't just kind of an apologetic copy of something that already exists? Um, and how can you kind of bring new thought to it. Um, and so what we ended up creating is Wilderton. And we've got three products and we make them all right here. Uh, two of them are distilled. One of them is made more through a compounding process. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but my idea immediately when he had when he brought up uh, non-alk spirits was that there was a way to do it with botanicals and with sort of a craft process. A craft process that um, was intuitive to me as a distiller and I'll kind of walk you through as we get a little bit closer to it. Awesome. Um, so here is what Shannon and I are going to cover today. So first of all, the case for having not excellent non-out cocktails. Um, this is a buzzy thing right now. People are talking about it a lot, but we'll just get into uh, the, the rationale that, that I slash we see for it. We'll talk about how non-out spirits are made. Um, I can't talk about how everyone else makes them, uh, but I can tell you how Wilderton makes them. And uh, that's really uh, something that we're very proud of, the, the way that we do it. We'll talk a little bit about roles botanicals uh, play in beverage perception, and that kind of feeds back into how we make Wilderton and, and why we use them. Um, then we'll talk about uh, just a little bit of sensory stuff, bona fide differences between alk and non-alk beverages, and the ways to think about that. Um, best practices for crafting non-alk cocktails based on those bona fide differences. You can't just pretend that uh, non-alk ingredients are the same as alcoholic ingredients. They, they, they behave differently. Uh, and then finally, we'll open the floor up for some Q&A. Um, and if you have questions along the way, like please uh, bring them up and we'll try to answer them in real time. Um, but we will try to leave the last uh, 10 or so minutes um, for some, some uh, Q&A. All right. There is a little bit about me. You are, I already talked about myself, so we'll skip that. Okay, so the case for excellent non-out cocktails. Um, excuse my corny images. Uh, I got a little <laughs> No, we love some it. Some of these. That's exactly uh, the type of person that's asking me about non-out cocktails and so why they're not <laughs> What's the point? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so the big headline here, the statistics keep coming out, um, you know, really good quality uh, data from institutions like Nielsen, consumer research firms, agencies are consistently reifying that 
people are drinking way less alcohol and zoomers uh people in gen z are drinking around 20 percent less alcohol than millennials there are there's a shocking number of people in gen z of legal drinking age who actually have never had alcohol so that starts to make me feel really old um, because you know when i grew up uh turning 21 was a rite of passage that came with like you know getting uh really quite intoxicated um and there's this whole generation that's growing up where that's not actually an expectation for them. And a lot of them are choosing just not to not to drink alcohol at all. And there's you know, any number of reasons for that. Uh, maybe it's the new research that's coming out about the, the you know, deleterious effects of alcohol that we hadn't quite understood before. Um, maybe it's that they can do things like uh, mushrooms and cannabis because those are more accessible. Um, and they're just cho not choosing to do it as much. But what we, what we do know about Gen Z as well is that they're being dubbed the foodie generation. Um, obviously, they're standing on the shoulders of giants, of the millennials. Uh, uh, they're, <laughs> but they're really especially interested in new culinary experiences, diverse flavors. Um, they're keeping all the cool, like, hole-in-the-wall restaurants alive. Like, uh, you know, thank God for them. So, you know, I see in that there's, like, the threat on the one hand uh, of, like, oh, my God, they're not drinking as much alcohol. What do we do uh, as a bar or as a restaurant that really you know, prides itself on uh, cocktails? Um, but there's a huge opportunity to appeal to them in other ways. Uh, and, and I think the moment is here where we need to be thinking about how we do that. Um, and that's not just for reasons of like, you know, the business and, and making sure you get this important consumer segment. Um, it's also kind of... It, invoke some bigger questions. So, you know, these emerging trends, as I say here, uh, emerging trends in drinking pose important business questions like, okay, how do we keep the lights on if we don't, if people aren't, you know, coming in for uh, their Jaeger bombs or their AMFs anymore. And then they also ask, arguably, I would say bigger questions, um, maybe even like sort of spiritual questions about like the meaning of hospitality and what right. we're all doing here. And I say we, but I, I'm not really technically in hospitality. Shannon is. Um, you all are. Uh, and we should I be think thinking that, about. Yeah, go ahead, Shannon. No, that's like a really, it's a that. really beautiful way that you've like posed that. It's like, what is the meaning um, of hospitality? Because I think like that sort of gets lost when you only have like such a closed scope of like what you think hospitality or bartending realistically is and like now we're kind of entering this new era where like hospitality realistically at its core and like at least to me means inclusivity and um you know it's more notable i think uh than it is not now to when you go into a bar and you look at their menu and you see that they don't have non-alcoholic options for the guest, you know, like that raises a much like bigger red flag, I think to me and maybe to most like patrons who are going out who are younger, um, that this might not be like an inclusive space for everybody. Um, so I think like that is like a really, really important to question to like bring up. I love that you have that in here. Cool. Yeah. You know, it's just, there's all these subliminal ways that people might not even notice, but, or be, be conscious of. Uh, as a as a customer, when you walk into a place and you kind of you vibe with it, it feels like it's for you, or maybe it feels less like it is. Uh, and having things on the menu that really kind of speak to you uh, and 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 signal that the place uh, you know that that business wants you there, not unlike you know having having vegan options, having vegetarian options, having you know accommodating celiacs. Um, but you know we're talking a lot about kind of categorical non drinkers, people who decide that they don't want to drink alcohol, sort of full stop for whatever reason. There's also so many, there's more and more people that are choosing to be in this gray area. You know, maybe they take a month off a year and do dry January, or maybe they just drink a little bit less during January, or maybe if they decide they don't want to drink on weeknights. Um, so there's all of these sort of occasions for non-alc and what we see uh, when we you know, when we coerce a bartender, uh, you know, bar manager uh, into putting a cocktail with Wilderton on the menu and kind of developing their non alcohol program, maybe they're a little reluctant at the beginning, but it's like they don't know what they don't know. And when you put that on your menu, when you put great non alcohol cocktails on there, uh, 
we have seen so many times people being completely uh, like flabbergasted, astounded by the number of people who will order them and who will also pay proper cocktail prices for them. Uh, because a good non-out cocktail should take every bit as much work and effort and, and intentionality as an alcoholic cocktail. Um, and it might involve, you know, more expensive ingredients. Um, but, but people, you know, once they bust out of this kind of paradigm of, uh, well, people are really paying for alcohol. Well, they're, they're paying for something that they enjoy. They're paying for a sensory experience. They are paying for, um, they are, you know, they're paying for, for, something that, that's that's really culinary uh, in nature. And there's a lot of people for whom the value add of, al of al having alcohol in there actually isn't a value add, but they'll have right. to pay, you know, 12, 14, whatever, uh, for uh, a really nicely made non out cocktail. Yeah, I think one of the things that I always find when I talk to somebody who is also somebody who doesn't drink anymore, like somebody who used to drink and then doesn't drink anymore, is that like one of the biggest things for them is that just feeling of um, being included with other people. So like being able, it's not that we don't have money to spend on drinks. Like I have a lot of money to spend on drinks, um, just not ones with alcohol in them. And I believe that this younger generation as well is like kind of moving in the same way. Like they want to have that overall experience of like enjoying a great meal or a great ambiance with their friends, but they just, want something a little different totally so there is ways <laughs> there are there are ways to kind of you know uh to, to, to have it all to um you know keep your bar program uh actually improve your bar program and make your space more sort of accessible more inclusive um and rid yourself of these you know financial concerns and actually see this as like a big financial opportunity like I always you know, challenge people to think about if they don't have a great non alcoholic cocktail uh, menu, you know, what's the opportunity cost that they're paying for that, uh, mm -hmm. that they're not even aware of. Um, and, you know, tea and lemonade doesn't really cut it anymore. Um, and we are, you know, uh, in the post Shirley Temple era. Um, and that's, you know, that's what I'm, I'm here for. That's what all of these new brands are here for. Yes. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how I make Wilderton. Um, it's a little bit of a departure from what we have been talking about. We'll try to tie it all together at the end. Uh, but I know that the audience here, you all are bartenders. You care about these things. And part of our mission at Wilderton is to make a product that's non-alcoholic, that deserves to be cared about. Um, it deserves to all of the probing questions that bartenders bring when they tour a distillery that makes whiskey uh, or, 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 you know, any other spirit behind the bar. Like you should be able to interrogate it, uh, peel back the onion and learn more and more and more and, 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 gain respect for the spirit, the more sort of you connect with it. Um, I have always been someone who's pretty, you know, interested in, in production details and really keen on transparency and showing how we make things. Um, the non-alc space right now, the, the industry is kind of in a nascent uh, stage where there's not a lot of that kind of questioning and also not a lot of forthcoming information from brands about how exactly they do it. Um, and so again, when I say that, you know, I'll tell you how we make our stuff, that's not me saying this is how all non-alc spirits um, are made, but uh, I, I do, I do want to walk you through it because I think you'll find it interesting. Um, so how is Wilderton made? The first most important thing about Wilderton is botanicals. Um, our inputs are things like this. So I've got, you know, white tea here and cinchona and ginger and Szechuan pepper. Um, that's our way of imparting character and structure to non-alc spirits. Um, that is the way that we, that we give our, that we give our, uh, product character. And we follow a, what I'm calling a craft spirits process. Um, and that's sort of intuitive to me, but it's also a word that isn't quite meaningful uh, because of the way it's been maybe misused or overused. So my definition of that is that it's raw ingredients to finished spirits um, under a single roof. Uh, it doesn't have to necessarily be under a single roof. In our case, it is. Um, but the work of a distiller and the work of a distillery is taking agricultural materials and that are in a relatively raw state, maybe they've been dehydrated, you know, we're not using fresh roses, we're using dehydrated uh, rose petals, and using uh, physical and chemical uh, processes to turn those into a finished spirit 
um, and you're doing all that work yourself. So it's not about just combining a bunch of extracts um, and saying, okay, here you go, here's the here's the finished product. Um, it's about actually taking things and solubilizing them and doing all of these things. So I'll get a little bit more specific about how um, how we do it. There's kind of two big buckets of what I think are the, the, the craft imperative that, that I'm living under here and what I take really seriously. One is formulation, um, especially with botanical spirits. It's a lot of it's really about the recipe and the work that you do before you even bring it into the distillery, you know, when you've modeled it on a bench top or, you know, road app like I've got here. Um, and the formulation really consists of, you know, conceptualization. So with our products, we've got luster, earthen, bittersweet aperitivo. Um, the luster is bright and citrusy. Um, I, you know, I created a mood board for it. I wanted it to look like the French Riviera and, uh, uh, you know, like a, Italian movies from the 60s where everyone's like sweaty and on and drinking, uh, you know, spritzes under nice umbrellas on the coast and stuff like that. And earthen is much more, uh, you know, dark and brooding and um, more kind of uh, has more of like a winter energy. So there's this, you know, think about what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and then you have to, at some point, put, you know, pencil to paper and start turning that into a recipe. And so you think about what botanicals you're going to use. Um, you know, what's going to be included in that recipe. And for, for me, something that was really, really important is selecting those botanicals in a way that really suits water as an extraction medium. So for instance, gin, uh, if you want to make a gin and you want to use juniper berries to get that, that juniper character that we're all very familiar with, it's, you know, it, it's bright and kind of medicinal and, and resinous. Um, you can't really use water to get a great juniper character. Um, so I, I started sort of disqualifying certain ingredients, certain botanicals that weren't well suited to water. Um, so that was a big adaptation that I had to make when I was thinking about this. But fortunately, having a background in tea, I had, I had a good sense of what comes through in water really well and what comes through in alcohol, having been on both sides of things. Um, you know, an example of something that comes through really great in water is, is bay leaf. And we do, we use bay leaf in water all the time, right? We put it in our soups and it imparts that nice bay character. Um, so botanical selection, uh, then composition, you know, turning up and down the knobs and figuring out what the right one is, what's going to achieve that effect that you had at the very beginning with conceptualization. And then finally, um, timing of use, where you introduce the botanicals, things that you add before distillation versus after distillation are going to have totally different effects. Um, things that you extract for a really long time are going to taste different than things you extract for a shorter period of time. Um, once you've figured out all those formulation questions, once I've done that, um, then it's a matter of uh, production. So you figure out how to scale it, um, uh, ask questions about how you're going to extract it, how you're going to distill it, um, finding infiltration, you know, making sure that they're, they're polished and um, uh, and and uh, you know attractive and sort of uh, congruent with the with the, the standards of the genre. So for us, you know, we've got the bittersweet aperitivo, which is an Italian style red bitter. Um, I decided at the outset that I didn't want it to be uh, I didn't want it to be you know cloudy or, or or opaque. I wanted it to be you know bright red, and you could see through the bottle. Um, hygiene <laughs> is something that is uh, that is particular to non-alk spirits uh, or you know, to a much higher degree, something that we're concerned about here uh, because our product is not by nature antiseptic uh, the way alcohol is. So uh, that's a really important production consideration. And then we also carry out packaging here. So um, that's sort of the world of things that I'm thinking about uh, when I think of, when I say something like, you know, craft that we're bringing a craft lens to the process. Um, so, Let's get a little bit more specific and I'll just show you how we do it. Um, I'm at the distillery right now. I'm at the lab um, and I'll walk into the cellar. Hopefully you can all see me. Okay. I'm just carrying my laptop here. All right. So here's our production cellar. And this consists of um, a few pieces of equipment that if you've toured many distilleries are actually not going to look terribly unfamiliar to you. First off, we've got our water ton here. 
And this is basically just a big extraction vessel. It's fitted with a false bottom. Um, this is something that, uh, that breweries use to extract sugar from, uh, from grains and then they'll add um, hops and everything to this. Uh, it's got a false bottom that acts as a sieve. So what I do then, what we do here is we'll load this up with, if we're making luster, for instance, it's gonna be um, bags of rose petals, bags of lemongrass, whole coriander seeds, uh, bay leaves, orris root, all of these things are gonna go in here. And again, that's agricultural material. Those are herbs and spices. They're gonna go in here. Uh, we heat up water over here in the hot liquor tank. Um, again, brewery equipment. This is just a big water kettle. We extract the botanicals in here um, in a closed environment. So we keep all those vapors inside and they're condensing and dropping back down. Um, just, and at this point we're making a very, very concentrated, uh, you know, aqueous extract. You could say it's sort of like an herbal tea, um, but it's, but it's, uh, but it's, it's very concentrated. Um, at this point, it's quite bitter. It is, you know, going to be kind of a brownish color. And if we're making the luster again or the earthen, um, after the extraction is complete, we run it out of here, um, separate it off the botanicals, and then we send the botanicals off for composting. And we run that extract, uh, pump that into the still here. Doesn't really easily fit into the frame, but this is a still. Um, so we've made a thousand gallons of extract in step one uh, in the lauder ton. We've removed the botanicals, we put them into the still. And if we put in a thousand gallons of extract here in the still, we are going to capture about 250 gallons of distillate. Um, why is that important? Uh, well, it's important because of the fact that we are concentrating um, that mixture. We are taking those herbs and spices um, and separating off sort of the volatile things, so the things that you would smell from the things that you would taste on the palate. So it's no longer going to be bitter. It's not going to be, um, it's not going to have uh, that color anymore. It's gonna come off clear, focused, and super aromatic. Um, and that is sort of the base of those, uh, of the earthen or the luster um, product. So awesome. this is a still sort of sort of like any other uh, one little factoid about it. You'll notice it's not copper, and that's because I don't have to worry about um, the types of things that the types of problems that copper solves that have to do right. with alcohol and fermentation. Our process does not use alcohol. Um, asterisk at any point <laughs> we can talk about that asterisk but it's kind of inconsequential we are not removing alcohol in this process and that's not okay. the only way that non out spirits are made there are some uh you'll hear about um you know alcohol removed whiskeys uh that's not our um rather than just to remove something um so would this technically be a compound then well, so compounding uh, actually applies a little bit more to the aperitivo. Uh, one, okay. one word that you could use to describe the process at this point when it's come off the still, uh, the, the product is a, is a hydrosol at that point. So okay. herbalists or you know, food nerds would have heard of this. A hydrosol is basically a water-based distillate. It's a distillate that, uh, of, that contains um, uh, plant extractives. Uh, it doesn't contain alcohol in it. So okay, rose awesome. water is a hydrosol. If you use witch hazel toner, that's a hydrosol of witch hazel. Uh, orange blossom water is another hydrosol. Um, we are in effect making a kind of complex hydrosol with many different botanicals in it. Uh, you know, earth, the luster has around 12, the earthen has you know, over 20. Um, and so we're using them sort of for that effect so that they can be used in cocktails. Okay, um, awesome. I don't think I've ever heard that language when we talk about like the, I've, I mean, I've heard like compounding and obviously, you know, dealkalization and osmosis and all of those other kind of like different ways. But hydrosol is, that is a new one for me. And thank you for digging in on that. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, probably not a word that your consumers are gonna no, uh, understand, but it's a little nerdy. All, like, but... yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it, it's a great th it's a great thing to know. Yeah, um, absolutely. I love yeah, I love learning new new uh, technical language. And then if we're making the bittersweet aperitivo, um, that's going to start off again in that lauder ton. Everything starts here because this is where we 
take the raw botanicals and turn them into something liquid. Um, but we don't distill that one. And that's where we would call it a compounding process. Um, you know, compounding is really another way of saying, uh, you know, infusion and, and combining things, but you're not necessarily using distillation. Um, that's the way that a lot of liqueurs are made. And the reason that we don't distill the bittersweet aperitivo um, has to do with what I said earlier, where I said that, you know, if you distill, you're removing those things that taste bitter. Uh, you're removing the, the things that really kind of modulate the, the palate, uh, the mouthfeel of the product. And an aperitivo, it, you know, and by my definition, ought to be bitter. Um, so we include things like gentian root and wormwood and quassia um, that give it the bitterness, and we need that to stay intact. Um, so we don't distill that one. We use some distillates in there, like orange blossom water, and we use other things. Um, but we have a, I have a lot of tricks up my sleeve that help us get to a point where that's a very intense uh, and dynamic uh, flavor, you know, gustatory experience without the use of distillation. And that, you know, that calls on my experience, uh, having made a lot of liqueurs that don't involve distillation. Awesome. Um, and then we package here. We do all of that here. Uh, we do all our filtration here. There's a lot to this, but um, uh, I think I can pause it there. We can ask more. Uh, oh, cool. Nice. LaShawn says, that's awesome. I make rosewater hydrosol for my dreadlocks. That's, that's really cool. Um, yeah, we could talk more sort of nerdy production stuff. I'd be, I'd be happy to, but that seems like a good enough overview for now. I'm not training you how to do my job, but I'm, I'm absolutely <laughs> happy to talk more about this. Uh, so that's how we make Wilderton. And I want to just give you a little breakdown of the bittersweet aperitivo product. You can think about sort of how I think about formulation. Um, I break all of these ingredients into categories when I'm thinking about them. Um, and one way that I do that is by using a perfumery framework, actually. If you notice, uh, if you go to a perfume counter, they'll talk about, oh, you know, Chanel number no. five has these top notes of, you know, aldehydes and bergamot. I don't actually know um, everything that's in there. And then it has the heart notes of rose and base notes of oak moss. What are they actually talking about there? Um, it seems like just marketing language, but it actually is, represents a uh, like a, a, a scientific sort of reality of what's in that composition, what's in that fragrance that uh, that will determine sort of when you encounter those things. So if they're saying that uh, bergamot is a top note, you're going to smell that bergamot first. You're, that's what you're going to smell at the at the perfume counter, um, pretty much before you smell anything else. After a few minutes, that's going to go away. Then you'll have that rose. Um, uh, and the bergamot won't really be there anymore. You'll start smelling some things kind of underneath that rose too, but that rose eventually will evaporate and you'll be left with things like uh, vanilla, oak moss, whatever. Again, I don't know what's in Chanel number no. five, so maybe that's not a helpful <laughs> example, but they're talking about kind of the parade of, fla of, of uh, fragrances that you're gonna smell and then the sequence of them. And those are determined by the nature of the materials themselves. And my botanicals, um, have the same sorts of characteristics to them. So when I'm thinking about how to structure a spirit uh, using botanicals, I want to make sure that I'm representing those things in a way that's appropriate for the style. So with an aperitivo, because, you know, as we know, uh, so much of our experience of tasting is actually olfaction. When we're talking about a perfume, obviously you're not tasting it from your mouth. You're, taste, you're, you're not smelling it from your, from your mouth. But you're smelling it, it's called orthonasally, which is through your nostrils, through the front. And when you taste, you're tasting retronasally. Um, retrona retronasal olfaction is uh, when uh, you use the uh, connective apparatus from your mouth to your nose and you get uh, fragrances that way. Differences between a perfume and tasting something like my bittersweet aperitivo is that that happens really, really quickly um, because the mouth is hot, it's warm, uh, it's wet, and it kind of accelerates all of that. And so it, it's like a very fast motion uh, version of perfume uh, appreciation where it's like, oh, that just happens super quickly. But we do talk about, okay, how does it smell in the glass? Those are the kind of the top notes jumping out. And what's the aftertaste? And those are some base notes. And then what happens in between? 
So we have our ways of doing this. I happen to like to think about it as a perfumer would because it's very instructive and because they have, they're very rigorous the way they talk about it. Um, so with the aperitivo, it's going to start off, uh, you know, when you, with an aperitivo, you don't want it to be super bottom heavy. You don't want it to have all these lingering heavy bass notes. So this one's much more about those top notes. It should be refreshing. It should wake up the palate. So I use a lot of citrus in this Seville orange grapefruit. There's some lemon in there as well. Um, wormwood is also a top note. Those are the things you're going to notice out of the glass. Um, when you taste it, uh, you'll start getting a little bit more of the cassia cinnamon, um, kubeb, orange blossoms and floral notes. And then it'll finish subtly with a little bit of angelica rhubarb and sandalwood um, and then on the palate the main thing you're going to get obviously it's going to be a little bit sweet it's got sweet in the name and it also has bitter in the name gentian root is uh gentian root is one of the key bitters that we um uh, that you see all over all types of amari and we use it in this one as well and again when i'm talking about all this all these things it's referring to actual ingredients that we're using in some sort of whole form uh, or maybe in an essential oil form in certain cases so just a little bit about my approach and how i think about these things and the type of work that i don't expect bartenders to do um, and I don't think that we should be expecting bartenders to be thinking about things this this way and to be going this deep uh, the work of bartending has to do uh, with sourcing the right ingredients where a lot of this kind of heavy lifting is done um, and you're combining them and uh, your artistry is kind of at that next level closer to the consumer. Um, I am a s obsessed with botanicals for uh, not only because it's a hobby, but because of the power of them. And there's all these different ways that botanicals can affect our perception um, and all of these different things that they can do that you can taste on the palate uh, or that you can smell. Uh, here's the McCormick spice wheel, which is just gives you a little <laughs> bit of a, a taste of uh, all of the ways that they're thinking about botanicals. Um, I think it's helpful that it's this is roughly a rainbow because uh, there are very few flavors that I can think of that you can't uh, accomplish in some way by finding the right herb spice uh, combination and then extracting the right way. Um, so again, that just gets back to why I'm so passionate about using botanicals to answer these questions of, um, of how to make a compelling spirit, uh, even if it doesn't have alcohol. So um, examples of botanicals and roles they play. First, we've got rose, uh, which is aromatic, but it doesn't have doesn't bring much to the palate. Um, it's pretty much purely aromatic. We have uh, botanicals that are both aromatic and bring something to the palate. And clove is a great example of that. It's going to smell like cloves. It'll also have that kind of numbing sensation. Then we've got artichoke, which famous famously in Chinar, it's got a little bit of a vegetal aroma, but I'm kind of rounding that down and saying that it's not really an aromatic ingredient, but it is very bitter. Um, so botanicals can play a lot of different roles. Uh, and those are just some examples of them. So I want to talk a little bit about alcohol and the flavor of alcohol because that helps guide the conversation about um, about how to make a non-alc cocktail that maybe doesn't mimic alcohol but feels like a cocktail in maybe some perceptual ways or subliminal ways that make people just say, "Oh, this is really good," or "This this feels like a real cocktail," even though it doesn't have alcohol. Um, so let's talk about the the flavor of alcohol. This is my attempt to be sort of analytical about it. This is a hard thing to answer because alcohol is very ethereal. It has a very specific flavor and it's hard to break it down into its constituent parts. Um, but I, I'm saying that it's hot. It's uh, pungent. You know, if you ever stuck your nose in a vat of vodka, you know what I'm talking about. Um, it's sweet. If you put a little bit of Everclear into a glass of water, uh, that first thing you would notice is that the water tastes like it has a little bit of sugar in it. Um, it has a certain viscosity, at least the way that we experience it, especially when it's cold, that's much different from water. Um, and it actually evokes a sort of poison response, an aversion response. And this is not me casting, you know, uh, this isn't a value judgment. This is just a biological thing. This is why alcohol is an acquired taste, right? Uh, you have to learn how to like it because biologically or physiologically disposed to run away from it um, because it technically is toxic. Um, 
we don't make spirits with alcohol here. We make it with water and water has some certain differences from alcohol. Um, it doesn't have much of a flavor we can describe at all because uh, we take it for granted and we, uh, it's mild. Uh, it's actually a little bit acidic because relative, because the pH of water is high relative to the pH of the mouth. And so you may not notice this, but you actually do have a, a, an acid response. Um, and, uh, the way that you taste it. And it's salubrious, which is my pretentious way of saying that it feels healthy. It feels like something that you want more of rather than something you want to run away from as if you've just taken a little sip of Everclear. So, okay, why is that useful? Why are we talking about this? Um, because I want to just kind of boil this all down to one general characterization about alcohol. All of these things are intense. You experience them as like, wow, there's a lot going on here, or this is maybe a little bit overwhelming. And spirits are alcohol concentrated. They're, dis they're, they're products of distillation typically. And so they are magnifications of this intensity. And so it's really important to be aware of that when you're making non-alc cocktails. And it's important for me to be aware of that making non-alc spirits, because that's kind of the gap that you're, that's the deficit that you're beginning with. You're kind of, if you if you want to make a non alk cocktail and this is this is your your uh, your your in flavor intensity standard, your tools are non alcoholic. You're automatically starting off here, so you need to figure out ways to impart intensity. Um, there's a lot of different people put a lot of thought into this. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about ours, um, but starting with you know the tools that we'll talk about in a moment uh, is a good a good place to start. So um, they begin with a natural deficit of intensity. And so useful kind of guidelines is impart some form of intensity, make it worth savoring, uh, make it something that you don't want to just chug really quickly, uh, make it maybe a little bit challenging as an homage to the poisonous nature of, of alcohol and sort of how that uh, frames our cocktail enjoyment experience. Um, and then be especially aware of over-sessionability uh, because a sessionable cocktail like a mojito is still more intense than lemonade. And if you're making something that tastes like lemonade, it's not going to feel like a cocktail. Yeah. Um, I think Jen, this like plays yeah, please, really well, you. like um, with the idea of like when we're making non-alcoholic cocktails, you, it's not that you want them to taste bad. You just want them to have a little bit more of a complexity to them because if you make something that is overly sessionable, like a raspberry lemonade or something along the lines of like an Arnold Palmer, people are going to like drink those things and just assume that they're drinking like a juice or something that is simplistic. Um, so you you want to create that little bit of intensity in there because that we're kind of like reminds people that they are drinking something of substance that is worth their money. It's a little bit of like a Jedi mind trick that you have to do with um, making non alcoholic cocktails. And if you like, you're always constantly kind of towing that line of like, yes, I want this to taste good, but I also want people to be, you know, asking questions about it while they're drinking it. What makes it drink this way? What makes this taste like a whiskey or what makes this taste like an aperitivo? Like, why am I tasting all these things when I know that it doesn't have any alcohol in it? Great. And that, um, that sets up sort of the, the next point here, <clears throat> which is common problems with, with non alk cocktails. Uh, this is just empirical from my, my personal experience, uh, going out and tasting them, uh, is that often they're too, in, they're, they're too sweet. Um, they're, uh, insipid or, or lacking intensity. Um, again, maybe it's a taste more like a lemonade or uh, a Shirley Temple, and that's not what I'm looking for in a non-out cocktail. And then thirdly, um, uninventive or lacking character. Um, and, and Shannon, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think like when we say things like uninventive, it's like when you try to take a product and just sub it out for a one for one in a cocktail, um, you're like, well, I am making, I need to make somebody a non out margarita. So you sub the tequila for one product and you build it the same way that you would normally build it. And what this typically does is lead you to a very unbalanced cocktail um, because you have never tried it before. I think it's important to treat any new spirit, whether it has full proof alcohol or no alcohol at all, 
you need to treat them with the same respect as you would treat any other and you know make sure you take the time to taste it make sure you take the the time to troubleshoot a cocktail a new cocktail um using things like a scamper map when you're building a cocktail to kind of try to replace um and find those new alternatives in the cocktail are really, really helpful when you're making things like non-out cocktails or non-out uh, menus. Um, so I think it's just like very, just be intentional when you're using a new product and make sure that you're giving it the time that you need to really kind of flesh it out. Cool. Um, Exactly. It does look like um, we've got, um, oh yeah, 250. We're going to do questions. Sorry. Yeah. Cool. So in light of all of this, non-alcoholic spirits are here to help. Um, I am making spirits with all of these things in mind and also knowing that bartenders want things that are interesting and that have, you know, <clears throat> have character behind them, but I'm not, I, I'm not solving all of the problems for you. And I just want to be really clear about that. I, I'm under no illusion that it's like, here's my panacea. Um, and so what do they, what do they bring to the table? Um, craft credentials and name recognition, maybe eventually. So, you know, we're, we're, we're new, but, uh, all, all brands, you know, that's going to emerge, like what are the craft non-alc brands and, and people will be looking for them. Um, that's going to happen. It's already starting to happen. Uh, flavor concentration, uh, intensity. We're doing a lot of that for you by using our cellar equipment um, so that you don't have to try to do that with a sous vide. Uh, what we do is, is really complex here um, and I'm all about delivering, you know, intense intense concentrated flavors uh, to make your lives easier. Depth of flavor, again, that whole like perfumery paradigm um, brings depth to it. Uh, shelf stability, um, you're not gonna have to throw these things away. Uh, they last pretty much indefinitely. The flavor will degrade after several months. Um, you can store them all on the back bar with all the aperitivo, please store it like a vermouth. So once it's open, put it in the fridge. Um, and so that makes it easy to integrate into service. It's supposed to make things easier for you while also improving the quality of your uh, of your cocktails. But they're different, with, different from alcoholic spirits. And so you have to kind of adapt your practices um, when you're making these cocktails. And so kind of getting back to what Shannon was saying, uh, you know, there's some fundamental adaptations here that I'm recommending. And this is um, just kind of a starting place. Shake less, stir less. Um, we don't need to dilute these as much, right? Uh, because we're, we're not diluting alcohol. Um, we are trying to just spread out the flavor a little bit and cool it down. Um, use less sugar uh, because they, these tend to turn out too sweet and there are reasons for that. Um, and then apply your creativity. The same things that you do for alcoholic cocktails, try those out with non-alc. Try fat washing, try clarification. Um, these are, these are ideas Shannon had that I thought were really great. Try large format, make a big punch with it. Um, of course, also be aware of the fact that they don't have alcohol in them. Um, things like infusions and stuff might, uh, might introduce things that grow mold. Um, fairly unlikely, but use your, use your senses on that. And which, drink them fast. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, and then finally, uh, let your senses guide you, evaluate and adjust. Uh, hold these to the same standard. If it's not working, you're gonna know it. Um, and don't tell yourself that, well, it's just a non alcohol it's not gonna be as good. Um, there are ways to do it. And that's what this kind of next final slide is about. Um, but I wanted to just do a little case study on one of my favorite cocktails uh, from a fellow named Jamal Hassan here in town. This is the Morning Crescent. And this is a, it's ultimately a Sazerac riff, uh, but one that he was really thoughtful about. Um, it's based around earthen. What I love about it is it's a short drink. Um, non alk drinks have historically been really long. Again, variations on lemonades and, and uh, Shirley Temples. This is a short drink. Um, he added a lot of tannin to it by using a black tea simple syrup. He didn't stir it too much. Um, and he served it on a big cube. Peixotes, bitters. It really felt like a Sazerac while also not be, while also being very much its own thing. But it was that same sort of experience where I found myself drinking it really slowly, savoring it. Um, and it was and it was novel and it was only possible because every ingredient was pulling its weight and it was very thoughtfully combined. And then um, this is a whole rabbit hole that we really aren't going to go very far down. Uh, but Shannon, do you want to talk about um, sort of some of these ideas we had for imparting intensity to a non-alcoholic cocktail? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, these are 
like things that you could definitely just take into consideration um, when you're talking about astringency. A lot of um, foolproof alcohols have a lot of astringency to them. So you're just going to usually need to impart that into your cocktail in some way. So think outside of the box. What else is astringent that is also palatable with this flavor profile that I am trying to accomplish? Using things like black teas or green teas, um, using different parts of the citrus in there are also really awesome. What kind of, like if you are doing a long drink, a uh, tonic versus a club or even, you know, a sparkling lemonade. I, one of my favorite things to use in um, cocktails it may not be astringent, but definitely helps add flavor body bubbles is like a sparkling apple cider um, because you get to add a little bit of like flavor into that cocktail and dilute it without losing um, like what dilution actually brings to a cocktail. Um, and then bitters is another great way to add astringency. Um, if you feel uncomfortable using your traditional bitters in a cocktail, because most of them do contain trace amounts of alcohol, um, there are great options out there right now for NA bitters, or you can make your own non-alcoholic compound to kind of put into that cocktail itself. You want to add that into that. Um, we got your McCormick wheel reminded me of the herb wheel we got to see in Milan at the Fernet Bronco plant. If you ever get a chance, it's a fascinating tour of all the ways that you can extract plants. And I think like extracting plants again, like you should be thinking about that when you look at teas, like what kind of flavor in these teas, I love using like different artisanal like tea blends to make like a big base to kind of help make up for like the body or, um, the other flavors that you get through, um, spirits it back into those cocktails. Um, piquancy is a big thing. Um, spiciness, normally when we drink cocktails, they are warm, they make us feel hot. Um, so like, that's another thing to like, think about, you know, using different types of peppers or different kinds of um, herbs that also have those same kind of like uh, flavor profiles to replicate what you might be missing out on in a foolproof drink. Cool. Right. And then yeah. I had a note here about body and you can use gums or clarified milk, egg whites. Again, we don't have to talk about all these in turn, but just some ideas they are thought starters. And hopefully this is just kind of priming your creative process. Yes. Uh, but I love that point about the Fernet Branca uh, uh, plant distillery, which I have yet to visit, but it's, it's very high on my list. Um, okay. So I think that we should just skip to Q and A. Shannon, yeah. do you agree? Okay. Absolutely. I've got a cool. question here from Jasmine. Um, yes, question. I like the idea of using nerdy words like compounds or hydrosols with guests who tend to call spirit-free liquors fancy tea. But I agree that language may be a little heavy for everyday conversations. What are keywords or language that we can use when talking to people about Boulderton? Yeah, great question. I So the, the, the term that I use is non-alc for non-alcoholic spirits, that is the word, that's the term that, it, that is emerging as the way to talk about kind of what all of us are doing. We're making things that we're selling in 750 milliliter bottles that are designed for use in uh, cocktails. Um, I don't tend to use words like uh, uh, co compounds or, or, or hydrosols just because you have to then define them. Non-alc spirits is confusing in its own way, but it tends to get, it tends to pique people's curiosity because they can, they understand what you're trying to say, but then they might ask you a little bit more about how they do it. Um, and then the next level of things that I'll talk about is that they're botanical spirits, non-alc botanical spirits. Um, I don't know if that's that's helpful for you. Uh, you know, I think that you can figure out your own spin that you put on it. But you know, sticking close to the word spirits, I have found uh, is very helpful. I also think that if you have the knowledge to like really educate a guest and they're asking for some sort of education, like by all means, like get nerdy on them. Because I think that people really, really appreciate that you have taken the time to understand how something is made that is new to the market. So if you're like in a slightly breezier conversation and you don't have the time to like really dig into it, then absolutely like I would go with what Seth recommended. But like, if you know, like tell them, like you should tell them because like, we want the word to get out. All right, I think we got next, this next one from Lisa. 
do the bitter compounds and the aperitivo help stabilize the grape juice in the base? Very, uh, very detailed <laughs> question, and, and, I, and I love it. Uh, yes, they do. Uh, you know, a lot of the ingredients, the botanicals they use have historically been used as preservatives, um, you know, repelling uh, pests, even like wormwood or, or fungus um, or microbes of other types. However, they're not enough. Um, so you'll find that with non-alk spirits, you're usually going to find potassium sorbate and or sodium benzoate, and there's always going to be some type of acid. Dropping down the pH is a really is the key kind of first level of defense to make this to make these uh, less likely to spoil. Um, but then you're going to usually find these other uh, preservatives. So we use potassium sorbate and sodium benzoate, which are in a lot of things like sriracha. Uh, we use them in our earthen and luster. With the aperitivo, since you're asking about it specifically, um, we have a natural botanical-based uh, preservation system that we're really proud of um, that uh, isn't really used to our knowledge anywhere else. We don't use potassium sorbate or sodium benzoate. But to answer your question specifically, the bitter compounds in the wormwood and all of those things are not sufficient um, to to uh, make it so it doesn't, for instance, start fermenting. And that's that's based on observation. That's based on a lot of lab testing. And that, you know, anecdotally has been a huge leap for me as an alcohol uh, distiller into non-alc is figuring out those things and how to conduct the right tests to make sure that your product will will stand up to the conditions of a bar, be open and closed and, and not, you know, go off. Cool. So we've got Corey's question here. Are there any special considerations for using non-alk spirits in batched or in draft cocktails? Um, and I think that that really is just like, that will just go in line with like, if you're doing this for your bar, um, like how your bar drinks and how the people and the patrons of your bar drink is kind of like how you're going to set your standard for that. And then secondly, you're going to see if your product that you're using is shelf stable or not. Um, if it's something that can be used over time and doesn't go bad over time, there are a lot of non-alk um, spirits out there that do need to be refrigerated constantly after they're opened because like they are volatile and will, um, you know, grow some fun stuff in there if you're not careful. Um, but I think like you would just approach that how you would approach um, a draft cocktail or batched cocktail in your bar normally, like you don't want anything that's lasted over, you know, two to three days, depending on what kind of citrus it is that you've got going on in there, because you know that lime juice goes bad way before lemon or orange or grapefruit or all of those things. So I think you just apply the same consideration that you take when you're focusing on the health of your guests for regular cocktails. Um, I would just take a little bit more precaution when it comes to like your NA, definitely look into the NA product that you're using and see how stable that is before you just like make a giant batch. And of course, I always think that making a smaller batch is better at first um, because, you know, the end idea is that you want to use all of it up um, and not have any left over. So smaller is always better, but, um, you know, just, just approach it with the same kind of um, awareness. All right. What do you say to people who don't want to use any spirits because they feel it is the to have a issue with alcohol and it can trigger them? I think that this is like a very, very thoughtful question. Um, and it's honestly something that like I have recently talked about with a few people going like on tour and talking with everyone about how they feel about any cocktails. There are a lot of people out there who don't want to drink something non-alcoholic that tastes like alcohol because they know that it'll trigger them. Um, realistically, you are not in charge of that person and what they choose to do. I think that the best thing that you can always do is make sure that you have a conversation with somebody, especially if you know that they have an issue with alcohol. Um, if this is a question that um, is coming down from like a manager or from a boss of like their way of like being like, this is why we don't have non-alcoholic cocktails. Um, I would just let them know that there are 
lots of different people out here in the world. There are a lot of people out here drinking and they, um, it's not, it's not just one type of person who is abstaining from alcohol anymore. You know, like it used to be when you're posed with the question, like, why don't you drink? It's either because you're an alcoholic or because you're pregnant. And now there are so many different answers to that question because it's become something that is not so like scrutinized against. Like it's not uncommon to run into somebody who doesn't drink anymore. Um, and their reasons can vary across the scale. So you never truly really know what type of person it is that you are serving. I would just say that, you know, it's no different than whether or not you or somebody were to come into your bar and ask for a cocktail and they have an issue with alcohol already, you would be serving them none the wiser. So I would just try not to take it to heart. I think if you know the person personally, obviously like have a conversation and you can always steer that with their um, objective taste, just like you would any other conversation about the cocktails on your menu. Totally. And I would just add that these, these people do exist and I've talked to plenty of them, you know, in tasting events or, uh, you know, the tasting room. And, and they, they are usually very aware of kind of their, you know, their triggers and what they can or can't engage with. Some people don't want to hold anything that's in a martini glass because there's that sensory sort of uh, association that they that they don't want to have and so um you know i always err on the side of, of being really cautious and so you know if i've got great non-alc cocktails that might make them feel like they're drinking an alcoholic cocktail and they don't want that i'm just going to say that and try to empower them with that information so that they can make the decision for themselves um it's all about transparency and making sure people know what they're getting into that's why i like the language like non-alc cocktails um so that people know that it's not a, it's not a lemonade it's not a cup of tea it is something that we're calling a cocktail and maybe if you're in this category um you don't want that okay we've got another question here as a bartender that loves to do heavy lifting what equipment would you recommend for diy no abv spirits or do you recommend it at all Sure. Uh, so, I mean, if you want to do really heavy lifting, you can get yourself a Rotovap, uh, which is, you know, almost like a, almost like a meme at this point of like and the nerdy bartender. Set you back, sir? Well, you can do cheaper than this one. I, okay. I did a, yeah, I did a Craigslist situation for, you know, a town that was a few hours away and needed the thing needed some repairs for like 500 bucks. Okay. Um, but that was, that was very cheap. Normally they're in the several thousands. Um, you could do that, uh, but if you don't want to do that, you want to carry out like, you know, again, I'm droning on about botanicals and how powerful they are. There are great ways to speed up botanical extraction um, using a, uh, like I'll do a lot of piloting using um, uh, using whipped cream chargers, uh, just like whipped cream uh, canisters and do extraction in those and that'll speed things up really quickly so you can iterate, uh, iterate quickly and taste and adjust. Um, you just put, you know, hot water or, or even cold water, put your botanicals in, um, charge the canister, let it sit for like five, 10 minutes. And, and you'll be very impressed with how much it uh, draws out of those. Another tool that I'd recommend if you're trying to get nerdy and do some heavy lifting is a, a sonicator, which you can find online for pretty cheap that are used for like jewelry and stuff. Those are another way to, uh, to uh, speed up extraction. And they'll also simulate um, aging. So if you want to, if you want to do extraction of like oak staves or something and you want that to come through really clearly, um, that'll take a long time by itself. But if you use a sonicator, um, that'll happen more, more quickly. And by the way, for questions like this, I, I love to share what I know. Um, hit me up on Instagram and we can, we can talk more about uh, specifics. But the sonicator, whipped cream charger, they're pretty cheap and, and will be fun toys to have. Awesome. Well, it looks like we have come to the end of our slideshow. So first I want to say thank you, Seth. Thank you, Wilderton. Um, everyone watching, uh, don't forget to submit your quiz at lushlifeproductions.com backslash Wilderton before January 17th uh, for a chance to win some awesome prizes. Um, and make sure you also are keeping an eye out for No Proof Strong Start companion PDF coming out later this month. Uh, 
by Kasira Hill and featuring a boatload, an actual boatload of spirit-free recipes uh, created by me that I made for this project um, that I thought were really, really special. And I, um, you know, in working with these pro products, wanted to make sure that I put a little bit of myself into the ethos of each one of these spirits. So I hope you guys really enjoy them. Um, if you enjoyed this class, please hit the like or love button and show some love in the comments. If you want to see more Portland Cocktail Week classes like this one, follow Portland Cocktail Week on Facebook at facebook.com backslash pdxcw or on YouTube. Uh, which is the youtube.com backslash pdxcw. Uh, we're also at pdxcw and at Lush Life Productions on Instagram, where you can find out what's coming up next over there. And you can find Seth on Instagram at postmalort. And I am Shannon the City underscore. Um, so hit us up if you want to talk about anything, no proof. Um, Seth that obviously is your guy for anything scientific. Um, if you have any like personal questions about sobriety or anything cocktail regarded, please feel free. My DMs are always open for you guys. Um, and after that, I'll see you guys back here next Monday, January 15th for the new age of non-alcoholic cocktails with Camille Vidal and Gaffard non-alcoholic cocktails or non-alcoholic liqueurs. Um, so stay hydrated guys. And thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks everyone. This has been great.